All right, section 10.4, we are going to be looking at measures of central tendency and variation. Um, so central tendency could be referred to as averages. We're going to look at how to average things. There's more than one way to do it. You may not have known that. Um, and then also measures of variation is how far things are away from whatever average we're looking at. So that's what we're going to be looking at in this section. Um, so the first average or measure of central tendency is the one you're probably most familiar with. Okay. Um, it's called the mean. It's also called the arithmetic mean. This is the quote-unquote average. So when you say average, this is the one you're talking about. It's found by adding everything together and dividing it by the number of values. So if you wanted to know the average cost of gas in Shawnee, you'd find out what the cost of gas is at every gas station. You'd add them all together, and then you'd divide by the number of gas stations. Right? We do this with your... Um, with your grades all the time. It's not super perfect when you consider homework versus like tests because they're worth different amounts. But if you wanted to talk about your test average, because we do that in this class, right? We use our test average. Your test average is taking all your tests, adding them together and dividing by the number of tests, okay? Median. Median is a middle value. It's found by listing all the numbers in numerical order. If there are an odd number of values, there will be one middle value, and that's the median. If there are an even number of values, there will be two middle values, and then you add those together and divide by two. Okay, so the picture you might want to have in your mind um, is where you put the kids in order in your classroom from shortest to tallest, right? There's someone that's in the middle, or there's two someones that are in the middle. Maybe they're even the same height. Sometimes that happens, too. And so that middle person or persons, um, their average, is going to be the median value. Median splits things in half, the lower 50%, the upper 50%. So a median is sometimes a good way to look at um, test values for a class, or maybe not even test values, but maybe grades in a class. If I put all of your grades in order and I put there's the middle value, I know that half, half the people were above this value in the class and half the people were below this value in the class. And sometimes that's a better measure of how well the class is doing than the mean. Okay, we'll talk about that in a little bit. The third one's mode. Mode is the number or numbers that occur most frequently. So if I were to ask every single one of you how old you are, we would probably have a really natural grouping at about 19 would be my guess at this point, just based on the, where people usually take this class, right? The number that occurs most frequently. So modes are often helpful when you have a lot of values that are really close or, or are identical, and you have sort of these crazy outliers, right? Like if we were to average our ages, my age in this class would throw things off because I'm considerably older than you guys are. That doesn't really make any sense to average my grade or my age in with a bunch of grade ages that are much lower than me. Um, if you were talking about um, like the... Um, salaries, I think we've got an example like this, um, salaries of people in a school district. Averaging in the superintendent might make things look a little skewed because he's going to make a whole lot more than the janitor or the teachers do, right? So it might not make sense to do an average in that sense. All right, so we're going to do some examples. We're going to find the mean median mode. This is a random selection of data. We'll get some that have actual like context to it to it in a minute to it in a minute. But we're going to find the mean, the median, and the mode. So this is just computational practice. So how do I find the mean? Add them all together. Yep, I add them all together. So the mean, um, it has a couple of notations, by the way. The one we're going to use is going to be x with a bar on the top of it. That's the mean. Um, another notation, just in case you have ever seen it before, is mu. It's the Greek letter mu. Um, so our book uses the x bar um, for what we're doing. So that's what I'm going to use. But like you said, or like Autumn said, we're going to add them all together. So we're going to have 18 plus 22 plus 22 plus 17 plus 30 plus 18 plus 12. And how many of them are there? There are seven. We're going to add those together and divide by seven. So you can either write out what I just wrote out here, or you can write out the next step, or you can write them both. What is the sum on top? 139? Okay. 
So you're going to take 139, you're going to divide it by 7. It's going to be almost 20, but not quite. We'll use one decimal with these. 19.9. That's the mean, the one that you're most familiar and comfortable calling the average. Okay, median. Median means we're going to put them in order. So you can do smallest to largest or largest to smallest. It doesn't really matter. I tend to go smallest to largest when I do this. So I would do 12. What comes after 12? 17. Two 18s. Two 22s and a 30. There are seven values here. There's an odd number of them. So if you sort of, you know, pair off going inside, you know, piece by piece, kind of like um, this. Here we go. And you're marking them off like this, one at a time, right? You end up with the middle value, and it's 18. So our median is 18. Piecewise moving inward. Mode. Now, mode is the number or numbers that occur most frequently. What's the mode here? Yeah, it's 18 and 22. We would call that bimodal. Okay? If they all occurred the same number of times, like maybe they all occurred once or they all occurred twice, even would be fine, then we would say there's no mode. Okay? But there's always a mode unless they occur all of them an equal number of times. Usually you see it to being one or two values. That seems to be the typical ones that we show um, in our notes or in our book, see in our book. Okay. So let's do something that has context. This grades one. The mean score on a test set of 20 tests is 75. What is the sum of the test scores? So I'm going to write out what our description was of mean in words. The mean is the sum divided by the number of values. Is that okay? What pieces of information are you given in th of this description in this problem? The mean and the number of values. There's three pieces of information we're given two of them. Maybe not the two that we are typically thinking we'd be given, but two of the three we can work with. So we're given the mean. What is the mean? 75. And we're given the number of values, which is 20, which means I'll just call it x. You can call it whatever you'd like on top. We're going to find the missing piece, which is the sum, and that's what we're asked to find. How would I go about doing that? Yeah, I'll multiply, in this case, by 20. So what is 75 times 20? 1,500. So the sum is 1,500. Okay, is that good? Okay, one more... One more piece on measures of central tendency, more example. All right, so it says, if the mean weight of seven linesmen on a team is 230 pounds and the mean weight of four backfield members is 190 pounds, what is the mean weight of the 11-person team? Now, you don't have to know football to do the problem, I promise. <laughs> That's actually why I put it in here is because... It's a little bit outside of my um, normal doings as well. And it's, it's still, it's fine for us to do. Um, the way that we have the problem set up is much like the last time. It's that the mean is equal to the sum divided by the number of values. Now, it's not quite as direct as our last problem. But do you know any of the values right off the top from the way that this is being described? <coughs> Okay, so we've got a mean weight, but it's a mean weight not of everybody, um, right? Okay. We know the number of what? Values. The number of values. How many values are there? There's 11. It's an 11-person team. It describes that. So, yep, we've got 11 people down here. 
I know the mean weight of some of them. Let me go back and highlight those actually. It says that the mean weight of seven of them is 230, and then it's 190 for four of them, right? The mean weight of four is 190. Those are the two means that I know. So if I know that the <coughs> average mean weight of seven people is 230, how much do they all weigh? Combined. What's that? I said 420. Okay, so 420. How did we get 420? I added two together. Oh, okay. So that would be if one person weighed 230 and another person weighed 190. But we don't just have one person that weighs 230. What do we have? Seven. Basically, we have seven people that each weigh 230. Are you with me? So in terms of averages, I have player one that weighs 230 and player two that weighs 230 and player three. There's, 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 there's seven of them that weigh 230 pounds. So you can write 230 out seven times, or what's a shortcut way of doing that? Yeah, we could do multiplication. We can take our 230 times our seven people. So that's seven of them. What about that 190? Yeah, there's 190 pounds for each of the four other members. Now, they don't all exactly weigh that, but on average they do. So we can treat it like they're all individually weighing that. <coughs> and this will give us, once we do the calculation, the mean that we're asked to find, the mean overall weight. Um, it has to be between 190 and 230, right? I mean, I'm averaging in weights that are between 190 and 230. It's got to be between those two. So if you get an answer that's either smaller 190 or bigger than 230, there's an error that's been made. Um, if I multiply 230 times 7 and 190 times 4 and I add them together, what do I get? Just for the top first. 2,370. Okay. And then if I divide by 11, what do I have? Two fifteen point five pounds is LB as a abbreviation. So the average of the team is 215.5 pounds on average. Is that good? Okay. So measures of central tendency is a small section in this section, small part of this section. Measures of variation is longer. Okay. So the measures of variation is what we're starting next. So there's lots of ways to talk about variation, and we're going to go through several of them. The first one is range. Um, you've heard range before. Um, range just means a spread of values. Um, you hear it used in algebra when you talk about domain and range, range being the spread of the y values specifically when we're talking from an algebraic context. But here, it's the spread of the values. Specifically, it's the difference between the largest and the smallest value in the data set. So if I were to go back to my data set before, the largest value is 30, the smallest value is 12. 30 minus 12, 18. 18 is my range. Okay, it's just a quick subtraction problem. It's how far spread apart the values are. The next three go together. These are the first, middle, and upper quartile. The first quartile is the value below which one-fourth of the data lies. The second quartile which is also called the median, we've already talked about that, right, is the value below uh, which half of our data values lie. <coughs> and then the upper quartile is the value below which 75% or three-fourths of our data values lie. So the lower three-fourths or the upper one-fourth. One you can think about that way too, okay? So this splits the values. So again, imagine all my kids in the class standing up here in height order, right? There's a middle person. That middle person is the median. He's Q2, right? He, that person, his height rather, is the Q2 value. And then there's going to be someone that's going to be like the middle of the lower group of students, right? They're the middle of that one. And they're going to be the point at which 25% of the class is all shorter than them. And then you've got the same thing on the upper end. You've got this person where 75% or three-fourths of the people are shorter than them, and then one-fourth or 25% or of the people are taller than them. And it's their heights that are these values. It's not a range of values. It's a specific person or height, in the case I'm giving you, that's the actual median or Q1 or Q3 values. 
okay? The inner quartile range is the difference between the upper quartile Q3 and the lower Q quartile Q1. So the range goes from the tallest to the shortest. The inner quartile range goes between Q3 and Q2, Q1. Right? So it's that inner piece right there. 50% um, of the people are between those values, right? Because it's 75% down from Q3 and it's 25% down from Q1, so trapped in between is 50%. Um, the lower extreme is simply the smallest value and the upper extreme is the largest value. And all of that information that we just talked about goes into a specific type of graph called a, a box plot. Sometimes you hear it called a box and whisker plot. Sorry. Okay, so we're gonna create a box and whisker plot from the data set that we actually used before and we had put them in order before and we need them in order to do this again. So we're going to start by rewriting them in numerical order, 12, 17, 18, 18, 22, 22, and 30. Okay, everybody good so far? Um, this data set has an exact middle value, right? It's actually a really nice one because it's odd. So the exact middle value was one of the 18s. Which one? The second one. There we go. Okay, so this is our median, otherwise known as Q2. If the median is one of my data values, which it is right now, we don't look at it for the bottom quarter. We look at everything that we did in circle. So there's three values down here, and I want the middle one of those. So what's the middle one of the bottom three? 17, so this is called Q1. And we do the same thing on the upper quarter. The middle value is the second Q2, or second 22, which is Q3. And I think it's worth mentioning what happens if I have an even number of values, because I don't actually have an example showing that, and sometimes that trips people up. So let me create a real quick just list of numbers so that we can talk about it. Do two more. I can't make it 16. How about 21 and 30? Okay. So let's say I have this this list over here. There's not not an odd number now. It's an even number, right? So in between, um, look. So if we go from the outside in, I end up with two values in the middle. Correct. So these two values are both in the middle. So what I do to get Q2 is I average them. So I say 20 plus 7 divided by 2, that's 27. I should have chosen nicer values, but I didn't. So now I'm left with what? What is it? 13.5, thank you. 13.5. So my Q2 would be 13.5. In doing that, 13.5 is actually right here in the middle, right? which means that the 1, 5, and 7 are still all three in the lower quartile, right? So I look at the middle value there, and I get a 5. And I look at the middle value here, and I get a 21. So I keep the two values that I averaged in the groupings that they would have split because the number I got for Q2 is in between them. So the only reason I eliminate it down here is because it's actually the data value in my set that's in the middle but it didn't happen on the other set. Do you see the difference? Okay, so we found Q1, Q2, Q3. What is my lower extreme? Mm -hmm. My lower extreme is 12, and my upper extreme would be 30. Um, and it doesn't ask me specifically to find the range or the inner quartile range, but I could do so if asked. What would the range be? What is it, sorry? 18. So it would be the 30 minus the 12, so it would be 18. My inner quartile range would be what? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so the interquartile range takes the Q3 value, that's 22, and it subtracts the Q1 value, that was 17, and so my interquartile range would be 5. Okay, again, it didn't specifically ask for that, but those are pieces that we just discussed, so I wanted you to see us actually doing that for one. All right, box plots, though. That's what we're asked to do. So what you're going to do is you're going to draw a long horizontal line. The horizontal line, line excuse me, needs to have every data value here on it somehow. So you can make a hash mark, especially because this data set this data set is small. So we're going to just start with the lower extreme. That's my 12. And I'm going to make a hash mark. And this one's 12. And I'm going to make hash marks all the way up to 30. I don't necessarily need to label every single one of them, but I'm going to label a few in between. And they need to be evenly distributed. So there's 13, 14. I'm going to label every other one. 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. How am I doing in space? Doing good still? Okay, good. 23, 24. 526. Oh, I'm not doing as good as I thought. Let me make it a little bit shifted over. That might be far enough. We'll see. 27, 28, 29, 30. We're close. Close enough, I think, anyway. Okay, so it's got to span all the values. Um, I'm going to put a dot, not on the line, but above it at each of the values identified. The Q1, the Q2, the Q3, the lower extreme, the upper extreme. I'm just going to put a dot above them, kind of like when we do dot plots, okay? So we had 12. They all need to be about the same height. We had 17. We had 18. We had 22. And 30. 30 is a little low. Maybe that's better. I can't tell. Okay. So those are all my values. All right. The lower and upper extremes get a line drawn between them and the Q1 and the Q3. So it looks like this. Something like that. Okay. Those are the whiskers. That's why it's called a box of whisker plots sometimes, is those look like whiskers. The parts in the middle actually get drawn in a box. So you're going to want to draw a box. The box will have the Q1 value and the Q3 value as the edges of the box. And the dot in the middle for the median or Q2 will have a vertical line drawn there. Like that. So this is one of these graphs that it takes all of the specific values and it kind of merges things together. I can't see all my values on this graph. I, don't, I can't see all my data values. But I can see some important features. I can see at quick glance where the median is, right? It's at 18. I can see where the lower and the upper extremes are, 12 and 30. I can see that the way that these values are grouping up, like, like merging together sort of in terms of variation, is they're sort of in here in the middle between 17 and 22. 50% of my values are in between there. There's 25% of my values in this lower sort of small whisker, and there's 25% of the values in this very long up, upper whisker, okay? So this is called a dot plot. I'm going to write the word title on it because in general, it needs a title, but we don't have any context for this one, so there's not gonna be a title to write. But in general, we would need a title for this just like anything else if we had context. Okay, how's that? Are we good? Okay. What we're moving into next is like true statistics. Like mean, median, and mode, those show up in statistics. Um, so proportional and statistical reasoning is the name of the class, right? So this is the statistics part. Um, a box and whisker plot sure, certainly shows up inside of a statistics class as well. But the things we're doing next are sort of more traditionally um, across the curriculum things that show up everywhere. So what we're going to look at is something called deviation. Um, there's two types of deviation. We're going to do the least common or least used one maybe first. This is mean absolute deviation. 
I will abbreviate it as MAD, okay? Mean absolute deviation. Um, what it does is it makes use of the absolute value to find the difference each data point is from the mean. Found by taking all the absolute values, differences, and then averaging them together. So this one, along with the next one, standard deviation, which I'll talk about in just a second, are most easily done inside of a, a kind of a, a, a table, I guess, okay? So we're gonna do a table when we get to doing this. Let me talk about standard deviation next before we do both of them, though. So variance, precursor to standard deviation, is found by taking the mean, subtracting the mean from each number, squaring the differences. This is the part where it's actually difference from mean absolute deviation. Step three in mean absolute deviation is finding absolute values. Step three in standard deviation and variation is actually found by squaring things. Then you find the sum of the squares and then you divide by the number of values. Mean absolute deviation, you find the sum of the absolute values, and then you divide by the absolute values, or divide by the um, number, of, number of values, is what I meant to say. And standard deviation is just finding the square root of the variance. So you take the square root of this, kind of makes sense, I squared everything up here, I take the square root down here. Um, those are not necessarily going to give you the same value, in fact, they seldom do but they give you a um, averaging technique for them. Okay, so we're gonna use our same fun data set that we keep using. And at this point, we kind of are going to wish a little bit that we had a nicer value for the mean than 19.9, but we're gonna be okay, okay? So back earlier, we found that the mean was 19.9. We're going to need that. Okay, so we're supposed to find the mean absolute deviation. This is part one or part A of number five. So we're going to create a table. And in our table, we're going to have the X values that are listed here. If you wanna put them in order, you can. I'm just gonna list them in the order they're already in, but you can certainly change that if you'd like. Okay, so these are our values, our seven <coughs> values. And the next column in our table is going to be taking the X value and subtracting the mean. Um, and you could do it in the other order if you wish, but we're gonna subtract the X value minus the mean. Um, but we don't really care what the X value the minus the mean is. We wanna know the difference overall. So we really want the absolute value of that. So why do I mention it? Well, I mention it because the sign doesn't matter. We're not gonna need it anyway, so we might as well not worry about it. So if I take 18, how far is 18 away from 19.9? It's 1.9 away, right? Doesn't matter if it's positive or negative, it's an absolute value I care about. How far is 22 away? What is it? 2.1. I got a couple of those. How about 17? 2.9. Thirty, ten point one, eighteen, one point nine. 10.1, 18, 1.9, we already did that one, and 12, 7.9. Okay, y'all good? All right, we're almost done with mean absolute deviation. We're gonna add these together. So you're gonna add 1.9, 2.1, 2.1, all the way down to 7.9. And then once you do so, somebody tell me what the sum is that you get. 28.9. Does everybody have 28.9? Okay. Then the way we find our mean absolute deviation is we take that 28.9 and we divide by seven because there's seven values we added together. What will we have? 
4.1. Our mean absolute deviation is 4.1. What that's saying is that on average, the values are spread apart by about 4.1 away from the mean, which was 19.9. Now notice that's not the same as this picture gave us information about. This picture talked about a middle value, not the mean, the median. It talked about the lower quartile and the upper quartile, and yet it's still giving you some kind of an idea of something pretty close. Can you see where 19.9 would be here? It'd be about right here, right? And if you went four away from that, you went up four and down four, you'd get most your values, wouldn't you? most of the values would be within 4.1 of the mean. So let's do variance and then standard deviation. Okay, so the first part much, looks much the same, in fact. So we can take the same data table that we already created and write it again. And I realize I'm kind of cheating, but I'm going to do it anyway, and I'm going to copy and paste mine. So it starts out the same you're going to have the column with the x values and the column with the, with the absolute values uh, between the mean, and the, the mean and the x value. Now, technically, the description for variance doesn't say anything about absolute values, and I realize that. But we're about to square everything. And what happens when you square numbers? They all become positive. So. If I wanted to preserve the fact that some of these are negative, that's okay. That's supposed to be 7.9 at the bottom. I fixed that. That's okay, but I'm about to square them anyway, and it's going to remove the negative. So don't really need to know which ones were positive versus negative when I'm about to square them. So in my next column, that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the x minus the x bar, or the, square, the uh, mean, and I'm going to square it. So that's going to take the previous column and square each of my values. So what is 1.9 squared? Mm-hmm. 3.61. And then 2.1 squared. 4.41. I got a couple of those. Uh, 2.9 squared, 8.41, about 10.1 squared, 102.01. I already did 1.9, so that one was 3.61, and then the last one is 7.9 squared. So this column is unique to this, it didn't happen in the last one. But at this point, we're doing the same thing we just did a moment ago. We're going to find the sum here, okay? So my sum of these values in this column now, what is my sum? 188.87. And then my variance, by the way, variance is S squared. That's the notation for variance because standard deviation is going to be S. So they don't have a different name for it. They just call it S squared for variance. Would be taking that 188.87 and dividing it by 7. What does that give you? Is it 26.9 or 9 what? 9 8, so it'll be 27. So 26.98 would be 27. So we have 27 for our variance. Now, our variance isn't really the same thing as the mean absolute deviation or really comparable. But what's comparable to the mean absolute deviation is the standard deviation. So part C, when it asks you to find the standard deviation, means we're going to take the square root of the variance, or the square root of S squared, or the square root of that 27. So with one decimal of accuracy. What is the square root of 27? <coughs> 5.2 is right. So that 5.2 is operating in the same way that that 4.1 was to tell you how far spread apart it is. And 
it's actually related to something called the normal distribution. So I'm going to do two more pieces of information, then we're going to stop for today, okay? So the standard deviation thing that we just found is connected to what's called a normal distribution. A normal distribution is a smooth bell-shaped curve that depicts frequency values distributed symmetrically about the mean. Visually, it looks something like this. In here in the middle is the mean. It should actually, you know, look symmetric. Mine's not great, but it's not bad. So this is a bell-shaped curve. So you've probably heard the phrase grading on a curve before, have you? That's this. That's not what you mean when you say by grading on the curve. When you say grading on a curve, you mean add a bunch of points to everybody's score, you know, make the highest score 100 or something like that. That's what you usually mean, right? What grading on a curve actually does is it says, okay, let's figure out what the mean was of everybody, and we'll put that in the middle, and then we'll spread all the data values out. And if you've got a large enough sample of people, like if it's a large enough class or a large enough grouping of something, like for test scores, then it means that you're going to have a bunch of people sort of tucked in the middle, and there's going to have a few people over here on the end, and there's going to be a few people here on the other end. And so these few people on the ends are going to be my A's and my F's. And the B's and the D's are going to be toward here in the middle. And then the very middle is going to be the C. Okay? It's normalizing grades. It doesn't work very well for a school like ours because we don't have big classes. So it doesn't even make any sense to talk about it that way. But if you were at the University of Oklahoma and you had 500 people in your class, and yes, that's normal, it might make more sense to do so in that environment. And so sometimes there are professors who will grade on a curve like that in a school that's like that. Now, here's where the standard deviation comes into play. The empirical rule applies to a normal distribution, and it says within one standard deviation of the mean, remember that standard deviation was that 5.2 thing that I just found, 68% of my data will fall there. So if I go out, and again, this is just me visualizing this, okay, so don't go looking at this and thinking it makes sense in terms of actual values, but this is what we're going to call it. This is one standard deviation out. So this is one out. Then if I look at the values here to here, then, again, it should be symmetric, it's not. 68% of the values lie from one standard deviation below the mean to one standard deviation above the mean. So if I were to go back to my data set, and again, it's a small data set, so it's not going to work perfectly. I get that. But we had 19.9. If I subtracted 5.2 and I added 5.2, if I had a big enough data set, I would expect that 68% of my data would be between that lower and that upper value of the subtraction. But we can do this for two standard deviations and for three standard deviations as well. So two standard deviations out. So we'll change colors. We'll go with blue. If I go out two standard deviations, then this value that I get in the blue part right here is going to be 95%. And if I do three standard deviations, which is almost off my grid, right, then it's going to be, I need another color, green. So three standard deviations out then I'm going to get 99.8% of my data is within the practically everything, right? And can you see five different sort of locations-ish where you could call grades here? You can almost see it, right? It looks like these values over here, I promise I'm almost done. Whoa, I wanted to highlight her. Over here might be your Fs, and this one might be your A's. And the ones that are in between here might be your B's and your D's. And the bulk of the grades that you're assigning would be C's in the middle. Can you see it? That's what grading on a curve means. Now, grading may not be a perfect example for this, but that's probably the example you've seen. There's lots of other examples of things that happen on normal distributions, and we'll pick up with that next class period.